it's Milo from the Rindewick system, a DID system. I use they, them, and he, him pronouns, and I am the co-host of the system, which means that me and one other system mate tend to front the most and do the most daily tasks, like going to work and things like that. When I imagine myself in our mind, I am a guy with blonde hair. It's uh, shorter than this, though, kind of messy, and green eyes, and I've got these pretty massive wings. <laughs> That are pretty cool and the feathers kind of end up all over me. I'm I'm a bit of a mess, but it's okay. I make up for it with humor and sarcasm. <laughs> I am co-consciously accompanied by my system mate Miriam, who uses she, her, and they, them pronouns. Um, she's got black hair, dark eyes, she's kind of gothic in style. I guess if I had to give her a role label, she would be a protector because she's pretty fierce and unafraid to tell people what she thinks and in defense of us most of the time. She might pop in later, um, give her thoughts on some things, but right now she's just kind of hanging back. Our topic that we've chosen this year is labels and their pros and cons in a few different contexts. But before we go on to that, I would like to seriously, truly thank the Plural Association for giving us the opportunity to present in this year's Plural Positivity World Conference. This is a fantastic opportunity for us to be more open about being a system, to be more vulnerable about it in ways that we really haven't been outside of one really close friend and in therapy. And I think it's important to be able to be more open about this. I mean, it's called the Plural Positivity World Conference. And so I think it's really great to be able to show people different sides of having DID or different sides of being multiple in general and how, how we are impacted by life and how we impact the people around us. All of that is really important to be able to teach other people. I would also like to thank you guys for watching this and taking interest in our topic. So without further ado, uh, we're going to talk about labels. My sexuality would be considered, I consider my sexuality, I consider myself queer. Um, and that has been a pretty complicated journey for me. <laughs> I used to consider myself a lesbian. Um, being in a female body, I just kind of figured that was the go-to. If I wasn't straight, then I had to be a lesbian. Um, but then I realized I also kind of like the occasional guy, and so, well, I guess I must be bisexual. But then there are people who aren't boys or girls who are also very attractive, and so then I decided that I was pansexual, um, but there was some trauma involved with coming out as pansexual, so I felt very uncomfortable using that label after that. And then I found out that my gender was probably more complicated than I thought, and I started thinking about that. And then I found out about possibly being a system, and then I found out about definitely being a system, and that just complicates it all up more than before. So at some point, on that roller coaster of choosing different words, I eventually just decided that I was queer. <laughs> um, and that that was a broad enough label that I could just explain it as needed, and otherwise it wasn't anyone's business, is basically what I decided. <laughs> um, but there are a lot of benefits to having a specific label for your sexuality, and I experienced many of them when I was on this journey of self-discovery. Um, having a specific label tends to be really helpful in finding other people like you, other people who've had similar experiences, who've gone through similar things, and who see the world in a similar way. Having that label in common and making it that easy to find each other, especially online and in Discord, things like that, having that label draws you into peer groups of people who can support you in having similar experiences. And I, I think that's really, really important. Um, without having peer support, I would have felt ostracized, I would have felt abnormal, I would have felt like I didn't fit in anywhere, and so having, having a word that connects me with other people going through the same thing made me feel so much less alone when it comes to my sexuality. Not to mention, having a specific word to describe what you're going through makes you feel so much more validated. Like, what I'm experiencing is something that other people go through to the point where it has its own name. And so that helped me feel so much more normal and so much more like what I was experiencing was okay and so much more like I wasn't alone. 
to know that there was a word for what I was experiencing put it all in a whole different perspective. Or words, in my case, since I went through a couple of them. Um, but on the flip side, having a specific word to put myself into kind of felt like boxing myself in. And so when I had the occasional guy that I liked, I felt like I couldn't possibly be a lesbian anymore. And when I found the occasional non-binary or genderqueer person that I was attracted to, I felt like I didn't really count as bisexual. And there's a lot of contention over bisexual versus pansexual. And really, I think it's down to the person. Um, but since I didn't feel very comfortable using the word pansexual to describe me, I felt stuck in bisexual. Um, when really, my, the definition of how I describe myself does not really fit how I think about bisexuality. And so that didn't really seem to sit well with me, and yet I felt like I was stuck in it if I was going to use that label. And so I kind of ended up in this cycle of trapping myself into a word that really didn't describe how fluid my experiences are. Um, and that comes into play a lot with being a system because I've learned that my sexuality can be quite influenced by the sexuality of others in my system. Mackenzie likes guys, mostly. She likes girls, too, but she does like guys. And so I was discovering that perhaps I didn't really like guys, but when Kenzie was nearby, I could feel that and was influenced by her presence passively. And so whoever she found attractive, I would, found, I would find slightly attractive. And so that, that complicated things as well. So at one point I decided that I would just go with queer and so that if anybody really asked and I felt comfortable explaining to them, queer was so broad that when I explained it to them, they would have no preconceptions. Um, they would have no definitions that they felt like would fit me because queer is so broad there aren't really any words to go with it. So whoever I explained it to would have no choice but to just stick with my explanation because there's no other explanation behind the word queer except not straight. And then I felt free to elaborate what not straight meant for me to anyone I decided deserved the explanation. So choosing the word queer felt very freeing from those types of boxes. Um, in addition, I think it benefited my system members as well, uh, the others in my system, because they felt a lot less confined by the sexuality that the body presented as um, because I was telling people that I was a lesbian, but Mackenzie liked guys, and so Mackenzie felt trapped in the word lesbian and like she could only be attracted to girls, when we, especially when we still felt like we had to be one person and we didn't, before we really understood what being a system meant. So having the word queer to describe us has freed not only me, but also the members of my system. And so trying to stick to sexuality labels really didn't work well for us, especially with the way we influence each other and with the way that we label each other. Gender labels ended up being quite similar for us as far as the pros and cons go, because on the pro side, deciding to present as non-binary gave us the opportunity to connect with other people who present as non-binary. We got to share our experiences on dysphoria, on medication, like taking tea, things like that. And so having that label connected us with people who were going through the same things as us. And yet, presenting as non-binary uh, didn't quite sit well with the system either. Because, for example, Kenzie is firmly a girl. She uses she, her pronouns, and she is a girl. We also have Cameron, who uses he, him pronouns and is very firmly a guy. Um, and so those, those people in our system still felt confined by the term non-binary. They felt like they always had to be non-binary. And yet we can't do that because we are so fluid. And so we ended up going with genderqueer, partially because it flows pretty well with queer queer and genderqueer, it tends to, it goes together and it sounds nice on the tongue. But also because it's another one of those words that allowed us to just elaborate as needed. So now feeling free in that, I mean, sometimes we use the word gender fluid as well because that, that works too. 
Um, but most of the time we just say we're genderqueer and then explain as needed. But that opens the system up to, to being able to present however we want and have it still fit in with the word we've chosen for ourselves. So like Mackenzie can wear skirts. She really likes skirts, but I absolutely hate them. <laughs> Um, so having a girl and a guy as co-hosts of a system has been, uh, definitely weird on the way we present our gender to the world because I dress like a 12 year old boy <laughs> and Mackenzie dresses like a mature woman. And so, uh, that tends to be a little weird for people in our life. And we've had to explain it a few times like, Hey, I'm feeling more like a guy today. So I dressed accordingly. And most people know that Rin Rindewick is genderqueer, and so will dress however they want to on any given day. <laughs> um, to our friends who don't know about the system, we're gender fluid, so that explains it as well. Like, hey, you're wearing a skirt today. Like, yeah, I'm gender fluid. It works. That's just this is just how I'm feeling today. When really, it's actually Kenzie. And that was a horrible impression of Mackenzie, by the way. <laughs> Mackenzie does not at all sound like that. Um, to be honest. Um, let's see. I don't know if I could do, I, I don't know. I've always been really bad at doing impressions of everyone else, even though they're fairly good at doing impressions of me, especially me and Mackenzie. I feel like everyone else can do impressions of each other, but I am so bad at doing impressions of any of them. The closest I could come to an impression of Mackenzie would be like my customer service voice, but I can't really pull that off when I'm not at my job. So I don't know. I give up. But anyway. Mackenzie now has the freedom to wear whatever she wants, and Cameron can wear whatever he wants, and I can wear whatever I want, and it fits with the label that we've chosen for ourselves. So the pros and cons of gender labels are very similar to the pros and cons of sexuality labels, and we've had very similar experiences with both regarding being a system, and regarding gender, and self-discovery, and explaining it to other people. So gender and sexuality are very much connected in that way as far as labels go. And both gender and sexuality relate to being a system pretty heavily because being plural affects your presentation so much. Even though I am always non-binary, Mackenzie is always a girl and Cameron is always a boy and Miriam tends to fluctuate between being a girl and non-binary. And so even though my gender never changes, the illusion of a single person that we present to the world looks like an ever-changing gender expression <laughs> and an ever-changing sexuality expression. So being a system very, very heavily impacts how we present our gender and sexuality to the world. And it's, it's been very important for us to choose a label that fits us accordingly. And the way queer and genderqueer are such open labels has fit that bill for us quite a bit. And it's been a lot more freeing for our system. Now, it's not like that for everyone. For, mo for many people, having a specific label for your sexuality and gender is really important. And in systems, I see it a lot that having your own label for your gender and sexuality makes you feel more like your own person. And so as far as feeling independent, having a label for your gender and sexuality can be very important for many members of many systems. And that makes a lot of sense having to divide yourself out to feel like you're a whole person has been a major difficulty for our system. And sometimes I wonder if maybe picking our own labels would help with that. Um, but most of the time we can remedy it by having people in our life that we can be open around, by having people in our system engage in their own personal skills, things like that. Mackenzie's a big writer and artist. She loves to draw, and that makes her feel like her. Miriam loves roller skating, so getting out our rollerblades helps Miriam feel more like her. And I really like our job, to be fair. Um, sometimes, it's tire sometimes it's tiring, but I do actually like our job. And I am a big reader and kind of a gamer, and so engaging in those things that I like makes me feel more confident that I am my own person. And so a lot of times having a specific label for the gender and sexuality of members of your system can help them feel more independent and more like, like individual, if that makes any sense. So I completely understand picking specific labels and whatever makes you and your system feel more comfortable is so very important. Um, it is just in our experience that we've built 
we have felt more cons with using labels than pros, to be honest. <laughs> so hence we go with queer and genderqueer, since they're such open words. Now, in a medical context, we have had a very different experience with labels than we have with gender and sexuality. Uh, gender and sexuality, we've wanted to keep quite open so that we can choose to explain it. But with medical terms, we've really narrowed those down on purpose because the pros in this situation outweigh the cons that we've experienced. The pros include finding self-help resources, like searching studying tips in Google does not really yield much for us because we have ADHD and those studying tips don't tend to work for us. But if we tack ADHD on the end of that Google search, studying tips ADHD, then we find some more helpful links that teach us more helpful tips to use in our daily life and in school and things like that. Because ADHD is uh, a pretty major difference in the way that you function and the way that you think and the way that you see the world, having that word, that acronym, ADHD, allows you to properly explain those differences and to properly accommodate them. So knowing that we have ADHD has allowed us access to proper self-help resources and accommodations in our life that have been super, super beneficial for us. And like gender and sexuality, having that word, having that acronym ADHD has allowed us to connect with other people with similar experiences. We can find people in our life or online who also have ADHD and we can connect with them and talk about our experiences and share tips and tricks and things like that that really help. And so that's just another pro to knowing that we have ADHD. We also have hypoglycemia, which is a blood sugar condition that's similar to diabetes, but only the low blood sugar aspect. And having that word and being able to find people online with hypoglycemia, because it's quite rare, so it's been a little tricky. There's like one subreddit. Um, but having access to other people with those experiences has been super helpful to us figuring out how to accommodate that condition. And avoiding that word would make it much harder to explain our symptoms of low blood sugar when they hit. So having to, having to label it, having that label hypoglycemia has allowed us to access accommodations just like it has with ADHD. Our coworkers know that we're hypoglycemic and are totally chill with covering our station for like five, ten minutes while we scarf down a snack bar, for example, because that can boost our low blood sugar and they know that having low blood sugar makes it significantly harder for us to function. And yet, on the flip side, especially with our ADHD, having a specific word for it can be uncomfortable. Um, because a lot of aspects of ADHD are more like a difference than a disorder, and yet it is called attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a lot of the time I feel like it's just, I think differently than other people. Um, our system just exists differently, and that has a lot to do with the ADHD. Um, in fact, we suspected autism for a while in our life, but through therapy and talking with friends, we've kind of determined that we're not autistic, that it's just anxiety and trauma and ADHD kind of mixing in a weird way that made us think we might be autistic. Um, our sister, best friend, practically our sister, even if we're not blood related, she's autistic. She's been super helpful on that journey. And so we've learned through her and through our research and through talking to people online tips to work around our ADHD. Now, they don't always work, but they do help a lot because there are many aspects of ADHD that do kind of make us disordered, like the executive functioning aspect of it. It's called executive dysfunction because it's a lot harder to do basic tasks to take care of yourself when your ADHD is kind of blocking you down from doing any tasks. And it's harder to study with the ADHD, things like that. But once you employ those tips, it can feel like totally different. Or once you have access to medication that works for you, then it can be totally different. And then this thing that's called a disorder feels more like you're just different than disordered. And there is a pretty helpful comparison. Um, it goes something like this. If everyone in the world grew wings tomorrow, except for you, you would not have a disorder or disability. But as people with wings started building buildings and houses without elevators or stairs, that and it kept you grounded on the first floor with no way to get up, then you would have a disability or disorder. So sometimes it feels more like 
just a difference that no one seems able to accommodate. Like, ADHD is a major disorder in schools because school absolutely horrifically fails to accommodate ADHD, even though a lot of kids actually have ADHD. So ADHD impacts kids in school just proportionately because of how significantly school fails to accommodate that. ADHD would not be as impactful as a disorder if school could just ch make some changes for kids with ADHD without sticking them in a classroom and with a special ed teacher and then just doing it that way. Like, there's a lot of things I could go on about regarding ADHD and the school system, but basically ADHD is sometimes made into a worse disorder than it has to be because of a lack of accommodations. And so I feel like sometimes medical labels lead to over-medicalization. I feel like ADHD has, is often over-medicalized, and that sometimes that can be a bad thing. So we have experienced more pros with ADHD and hypoglycemia as medical labels, but we know some people who feel confined by those and feel over-medicalized by those. And so that's just some pros and cons of medical labels. When it comes to being a system, I definitely think plurality is very over-medicalized. And actually, we've told our therapist that we don't think being plural itself is a source of distress for us. And that might sound weird to people who've only really ever heard of DID as this debilitating problem, like it's depicted in TV shows and things like that. Don't get me started on Moon Knight or Split. <laughs> um, but it's not, it's not always that way, not, not for every system, not, not even for most systems. We do not feel like having DID is debilitating for us. We feel like having dissociation, we feel like having trouble working together, having depression and anxiety, we feel like those things are, are problems for us right now. But we feel like if we can work around those, that being plural is not inherently distressing for us. We think if we get around those, we can be perfectly happy as a system. No integration necessary. I mean, we'd like to achieve some more co-consciousness just to help with memory. So that way of looking at integration would be helpful for us, but actual merging or fusion into like a single or a few people would not, I think, be necessary for us. I think if we can work around the problems we're having, we can be perfectly functional and happy. And a lot of systems feel that way, actually. And there are many systems that don't attribute their existence to trauma at all. Maybe they don't feel they've experienced trauma, or they did experience trauma, but they don't think it caused them to be a system. And trying to force those people into this box of, no, you have to have DID or OSDD or you're not a system, is disingenuous. There is a lot science doesn't know about the mind. In fact, it hardly knows anything about the mind compared to what it's capable of and the things that, the things that science has tried to research and not found out much about. There's just so much the mind can do that we don't know about that it is wrong to try and claim what it can or can't do, you know? So I feel like trying to force systems into this medicalized box of what plurality is, is not only stopping the furthering of science as far as psychology goes, but it's also really harmful for other systems. So I definitely think plurality is over-medicalized. And yet I also think that defining our origins or trying to define our origins has been somewhat harmful for us as a system. Because yes, we, we do use the term DID. We do, we do use that label as like an origin for our system. But we also kind of take on the perspective of not really caring. <laughs> um, we've kind of decided we're plural and you know, there's more than one of us and we can't really change that now, and we, we're working together much better than we ever have, and we're working around the problems that we do have in our life, so none of us really, none of us really care that much, I guess, about how we were really truly formed. We think it was probably trauma, and it probably was, but we've decided not to confuse ourselves with it, and we've met a few systems who are like that as well. Um, there's actually a word for it. I cannot for the life of me remember what it is right now, but there is a word for basically not caring about where your system came from. And that's kind of the perspective we've taken on it, is we have trauma and we have 
bad dissociation. So we're in therapy to solve those problems, but we don't view our plurality inherently as a disorder. Now, there are also labels in systems, for example, your role. And as far as I've heard, and as far as I've been able to research, many of those words were thought up by psychiatrists and psychologists, and some of them were added onto by systems. And we have found that we don't really like those. <laughs> um, plenty of people find them super duper helpful. Being able to have a defined role has helped some systems work on their structure and helped them with their routines and things like that. Our personal experiences have just found us going through way more cons for role labels than pros. Now, some examples of role labels are like um, host, protector, caretaker, persecutor. Those are some examples of some roles that systems and system members take on. When we first started learning about our internal systems, about our inner world, and about the structure of our system, we stuck pretty heavily to those roles. I was a host. Mackenzie was a protector. Miriam, I think, was a persecutor. I think we called Miriam a persecutor. But Miriam used to be um, two different members that kind of became Miriam. And who Miri used to be, one of them was, I think we called her a persecutor. Um, and then our system mate, Thea, um, she was labeled a caretaker. And those are just some examples of how we used to use labels in our system. But what happened is that when I couldn't handle something in daily life, I felt like a failure of a host. I felt inadequate. Or when Mackenzie didn't feel ready to stand up for us in, in one situation or another, or um, didn't set boundaries she thought she should have, then she felt inadequate. And she felt like she was too weak to be a protector. Um, and then, oh man, um, calling members of our system persecutors ended up being so bad for us because we did not have a healthy perspective on the role of a persecutor. Um, and some systems do still find that very helpful, especially when there is a persecutor in your system who wants to talk to other members of other systems who consider themselves persecutors then it's like gender and sexuality in that you can find people with similar experiences that way. But our system personally had a very unhealthy perspective on persecutors. It, I guess it's similar to how I stopped being able to call myself pansexual because of some trauma I experienced with that. We stopped being able to use the word persecutor because of how horribly it went for our system. We ostracized her. We didn't trust her to, to even front unsupervised, and when she did, um, obviously she wanted to lash out because we were practically containing her, and so it really just wasn't healthy for us at all, the way that we perceived our persecutor. Um, and so we just did away, we ended up doing away with the labels when we finally reconciled with her. So we did away with the label of persecutor, and we did away with the label of protector, and once we started on the path of doing away with labels, we realized that we were experiencing more cons for those labels than pros. Now there are pros to using labels. Like I said, you can find other members of other systems with similar experiences to you because you all have a similar label that you're using to describe your role. And having a role helps a lot of systems define the structure and their routines. And for some systems, that's really important for functioning. And it also helps you explain the structure of your system to others. There are a lot of pros for using role labels, and we just found that we did not experience enough of those pros versus the cons. For us, the cons were sticking members of our system into this role and feeling like they couldn't lead. So it felt like Mackenzie was never allowed to have any times of weakness. It felt like I was never allowed to feel like I couldn't handle our daily life. It felt like um, the girl that we called a prosecutor, a persecutor, it felt like she wasn't allowed to show her emotions, to care for someone, because it felt like all she could do was, all she could do was try and solve our problems with her. And so once we were able to finally reconcile with that, once we were able to understand that hurt is not all there is to it, that we can work together, then that's when we decided to do away with our labels. 
and it just kept going further and further until we stopped using labels at all. So that's when Mackenzie and I both kind of became co-hosts, and if we had to label ourselves now, I think we would both be considered protectors. Um, and having more than one host helped us put each other on equal footing, because I used to consider myself the only host. I had some serious host syndrome, we called it, um, which meant that I tried to put myself above the other members of my system. Um, I tried to consider myself the original, and it really wasn't healthy. So doing away with those labels helped with my host syndrome as well. Now, if we had to label Miri, she would be a protector as well, I think. And Thea still does a lot of caretakery things, but she also just takes breaks now, and Mackenzie doesn't feel bad when she can't set a boundary, because boundaries are hard. We're practicing that in therapy right now, and boundaries are really hard. We are all working to get better at setting boundaries. And so role labels didn't really work out for us, but they do work out for many systems, and so do with your system what you think is best, and what you can all agree on. So that's that on role labels. I took a brief break in recording in order to collect our thoughts and review what we already have, and also to do some grounding. It's Miri. I use she and they pronouns. Milo said I'd probably pop in, and I did. Um, but my thoughts and feelings on things are quite similar to Milo, if a little bit different. We've talked about all of this as a system and done our compromising on it, and so we all have very similar thoughts on it at this point. But I still have a unique perspective. Um, parts of who I am were involved in how we decided to stop using role labels. So even though Miri was not around back then, a part of who I am now was called a persecutor, and another part of who I am now was on the other side of that. And I do have to say it was um, really hard and uncomfortable at that time, and that I'm glad we don't really use those labels anymore. But, contrastly, I do consider myself a lesbian in sexuality, and yet I do not label my gender. <laughs> I just know that I am mostly feminine, um, but not all the way, and not always. And I am also interested in other people who are mostly feminine. So I consider myself a lesbian, but yet don't choose a gender label. Um, calling myself a lesbian has just been something that I've used to make myself feel more individual and independent. Like how Milo said I really like rollerblading, and that that's kind of my thing, that's something I get to do with our friends, and that is, that is something that I do, because I struggle a lot with feeling like my own person, and feeling like people see me as me. We only really have one or two people in our life that see us independently, and so it's been really important for me to be able to separate myself that way. Um, yeah. And yet, with role labels, I just don't like them <laughs> at all. I also consider labels in all of those contexts to be a tool. Um, labels are definitely a tool. Now, as far as sexuality and gender goes, we picked up that tool, used it for a little while, and then put it back down again. Medical labels, we picked up that tool, found it incredibly useful, and we still use it today. With role labels, we picked up that tool, accidentally hurt ourselves with it, and decided never to use it again. <laughs> um, so role labels and sexuality labels, medical labels, gender labels, those are definitely tools that can be used in very helpful and beneficial ways, and that continue to be used in very helpful and beneficial ways for some people. In our case, we just picked and chose those tools very carefully because not all of them were useful for us as, as our own people. Now, again, other people may find them useful, we just didn't in a lot of those cases. So, the comparison of labels as tools I think is very apt. Uh, someone named Wednesday Holmes wrote, wrote it on a site called adventuresintimeandgender.org, and one of the first one of the first lines of Wednesday's article goes like this. It says, people and labels are like cats and boxes. If you put the box on the floor, the cat may well get in of its own accord, but if you try and put a cat in a box, it'll jump straight out. And I think that quote is very apt regarding labels, because people may very well get into a box, choose a label of their own accord, and feel very secure in that, and feel like that is very beneficial for them. And it can be. 
and yet when other people force a person into a box or label, and like even in our own system, we have forced each other into labels, and that has historically been very uncomfortable for us. So in that regard, I think people are like cats in boxes when it comes to labels. There is so much variation in systems, and there is so much we don't know about how our brains work, and so I think it's really important for people, for systems, on an individual basis to get to decide that for themselves, because that is a that is an inherently personal journey, and you should get to decide how you share that with others, how you label that for others or for yourself. So in conclusion, labels, are they bad? Are they good? Kind of both. And it depends on who you are and how you feel about them, whether you would like to use them or not. To kind of wrap up our presentation this year, I would like to once again thank the Plural Association. I think this is the most open we've ever been through talking, because we've talked about this kind of thing online. But otherwise, I think this was the most open we've ever been vocally about our experiences as a system, and this has been a fantastic opportunity to do so, because it is something that we need to practice in order to be able to interact as ourselves with the people in our life, and with our therapist for that matter. So thank you to the Plural Association, and thank you for watching, and I hope you have a great day, and that this has given you a new perspective on labels in these different contexts. Thank you.